I'm jo uh, Dr. Joshua Wexman. I teach uh, computer science at Stern College for Women, uh, part of Yeshiva University. And today I'm going to be speaking uh, about uh, a specific facet of an ongoing project, which is a digital edition of the Babylonian Talmud. Um, so uh, just uh, this digital edition is multimodal uh, in the sense that in addition to the standard text of the Talmud, it also presents uh, information using color, using pop-up windows, with biographical data, uh, relevant social network graphs. Uh, now, while multimodality is a great thing to have in the case of the Talmud, um, there's a tension, uh, a pull in the form of the traditional form of the printed page. Um, in Hebrew, this is called the Tzurat Hadaf. Uh, this pagination and layout has scholarly and cultural importance, and it's critical to the acceptance of this digital text by the consumers of it. Uh, so to that end, we've developed an algorithm for projecting the layout from a traditional page uh, onto our dynamic and uh, multimodal content. So uh, briefly, just uh, let's get a definition of multimodal. A text is multimodal uh, if its meanings are realized through more than one semiotic code. Uh, these different ways of imparting meaning can include uh, the linguistic via written or spoken language, visual via still or moving image, uh, audio, uh, gestural, and uh, spatial meanings. Uh, and creating such digital works, especially, uh, in, uh, especially in digital works, we often want to move beyond the limitations of the printed page. For example, um, if you had a web page, uh, we could embed relevant images or relate information via hyperlinks to allow nonlinear explanation of the text and so on. Um, so, uh, so, meanwhile, uh, a published work can't simply be reduced to a string of words and characters, the text in its uh, raw state. The literary theorist Gerard uh, Jeanette uh, uh, noted the existence of a paratext. Uh, that is, those things that accompany the text, especially in a published work. These include various metadata, such as the author's name, the title of the text, uh, the preface, uh, any accompanying illustrations. Uh, those might make it multimodal. Um, this would also uh, include formatting and layout decisions within the text, reviews of the work, interviews with the author, author and so on. Uh, so what if there's a tension between creating a new multimodal digital, digital edition and the preservation of a particular paratext? Uh, so this was the issue that we faced in our digital edition of the Babylonian Talmud. Um, so uh, just to quickly introduce the Talmud. Um, it's a central canonical text in Judaism written in several different languages. Uh, it's a legal, ethical, and religious text, uh, and it contains extensive discourse. Uh, it's a record of legal discussions and analysis spanning several centuries. Uh, nowadays, it's the focus of much religious and academic interest. Uh, now, it might also be considered the world's first hypertext um, in the sense that uh, it's actually composed of several different documents by different authors in different centuries. Uh, they're all on the same page. They reference one another uh, in the text. So for example, right over here, this is the text in the central column. And here are little bits of text that are uh, commenting upon it. Um, and, um, uh, and they reference one another. So one commentary can reference another commentary. Um, and, uh, so th and they're all meant to be studied in tandem. Uh, so in the center column, what we have here is uh, the Mishnah, which is a recording of legal positions of rabbinic scholars composed in Israel over the first two centuries CE. Uh, in the same column after the Mishnah, we have uh, the Talmud, which records the discussions by other scholars in Israel and Babylonia in the ensuing centuries. Uh, in the surrounding columns in a slightly different font um, are uh, other commentary texts produced in other countries and centuries uh, providing different types of analyses. So this is the standard look and feel uh, of the Talmud in a printed text. Um, in the meantime, uh, in this project that we've been working on for a while, uh, we've been working on this digital uh, version of the Talmud. Uh, the full discussion of the features of it are beyond the scope of this talk, but briefly our aim is to move uh, the conversation from uh, the legal positions and proofs that typically occur uh, in analysis of the Talmud um, to a greater focus on the people um, and on their scholastic relationships. Um, and so in this particular uh, picture, we've performed named entity recognition. We've highlighted uh, people based on 
their scholastic generation. And here's a uh, social network uh, graph of how they relate to one another. Um, so, uh, and the highlighting, the color highlighting is done in both in Hebrew and in Aramaic. Um, and this is, of course, not the full graph. It's a subgraph of uh, our uh, much larger scholastic social network. Um, so, for example, in the text on the, pa on the page, these four people are highlighted in blue, in, uh, in green, and in purple. They're resolving a contradiction between an earlier source and somebody, something that somebody named Rava said. So why are these particular four people speaking and why in this order? So the color highlighting shows, uh, once we understand what the color highlighting means, that this is actually a chronological order of, of successive scholastic generations. And the subgraph uh, to the right shows that these four people right over here uh, are all students of Rava and they're coming to his defense. Uh, so this is a useful and engaging presentation of the text, but the problem is that it doesn't look like the typical page of the Talmud, uh, and that can prevent it from being studied like a typical page of the Talmud. Um, now, uh, let's, uh, the Talmud solidified into its present form and layout only recently. Uh, for about a millennium, uh, it was transmitted in, in uh, manuscript form, copied by scribes. Uh, in this picture is the Munich manuscript, which is the only extant complete manuscript of the Talmud. There are others that are not complete. Uh, we see here the Mishnah right over here uh, with the Talmudic text wrapped around it, uh, but there are no other commentaries on the page. Um, now, the first printing of the Talmud was in 1848 by the Sencino family. Uh, note that we have the center column of the Talmud and surrounding columns. Um, here is uh, a later Talmud pu published in Venice by Daniel Bomber's, Bomberg's Press starting about 1520. Besides the features of the wraparound commentaries of Rashi and Tosafot, uh, these sta th this standardized the pagination of the Talmud. Uh, by this, I mean that all subsequent editions have the same words on each page, even if the full line by line layout differs. Uh, so this, the, the first word here is Mavoy, the S, uh, the, and this last word over here, it's going to be the same in all subsequent editions, uh, even though line by line is going to be different. Uh, it's also multimodal. Note over here, this is a diagram uh, to help illustrate a specific architectural point. Um, so next, we have the Vilna edition published by the Widows Ram and Brothers Ram in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, this standardized the in-page layout in terms of the placement of the commentaries, um, which words, oops, I think I went, yeah, no, we're, we're good. Um, which words appear on each line. So it's, uh, uh, and uh, the shape of each of these bounding boxes, you see how this text wraps around in this particular manner. Um, so all subsequent printings of the Talmud base themselves on this standardized pagination and layout, even if they improve the text uh, or add new features such as new fonts and commentaries. Um, and let's just very briefly get a uh, sense of just what this layout is. Um, so running at the top of each page is um, meta information, so the chapter title, which is Mavay Shukavoa. Here's the chapter uh, number, the track date or volume, the name, and this is the page number. Um, so in the center column, we have uh, the actual uh, Talmudic text is the mission of followed by the Talmud's commentary on it. This is printed in a large block, block print, making it very easy to read. Um, in the, uh, oops, one second. Right, so in the inner margin of each page is the commentary of Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo, son of Yitzchak, who lived in France in the 9th to 10th centuries. His focus is on the meaning of the Talmudic text. So he explained difficult Aramaic words and phrases and the straightforward meaning of the text. Rashi's commentary is printed in a Sephardic semi-cursive font, which is known nowadays as Rashi script, even though he himself didn't employ that script. Uh, in the outer margin uh, is uh, the commentary of Tosafot, which is from academies uh, arising in France and Germany in the centuries following Rashi. They'll argue and uh, discuss and argue with Rashi's commentary. So it's text upon text. Uh, while Rashi's commentary is local to the page, Tosfit uh, focus globally on the entire Talmudic corpus and they raise difficulties from other pages or, or other track dates and work to harmonize them. Uh, Tosafot is also printed in the same Rashi script. So these three columns together form the essence of the Talmudic layout. Interestingly, the form of the page, the shape of the relative bounding boxes uh, corresponds with the genre and difficulty of the text. For instance, a page with a lot of Talmudic text, but little or no commentary uh, will, uh, 
be straightforward discussion. If there's a lot of Rashi, but little Tosafot, it might be narrative. If there's little Talmud, but a lot of commentary is going to be dense and hard to understand argumentation. Uh, now, there are other commentaries um, that appear on the page. So, for example, this over here is called Ein Mishpat from 16th century in Italy. Um, the Talmud is the basis for later legal texts, such as Maimonides' Mishnah, Mishnah Torah. Uh, these, there, these here are footnote letters that appear uh, within the main body of the text. Um, and uh, it, where there's a statement that made, uh, that, where there's a statement that is made that accords with the final ruling. Um, and so these are uh, basically references and in later texts, these are hyperlinks, um, right, in, in some digital editions uh, of the Talmud. Uh, now there are other uh, commentaries on the margins that uh, play other roles, uh, but uh, for now, in the interest of time, I'm skipping them. Uh, I'll just let you quickly scan the text over here. Um, so uh, let's discuss the cultural and literary importance of, uh, importance of the layout. Uh, so there are uh, other texts that do have a wrapping commentary columns. For example, this is the Decretum, a collection of canon law written in Latin, compiled in the 12th century. This is uh, this edition is from Bologna, 1250, and has commentary in the surrounding columns. Um, and besides the Talmud, there's also other texts that are referred to by scholars in such manner, such as the work of Plato, where they use Stephanus pagination, uh, and hear the details of it, or uh, for um, Aristotle, or Becker numbers, um, scholars of English law refer to the original Blackstone pagination, even though that pagination changed in later printings. Uh, still, it's not exactly the same as the case by Talmud, where the look and feel of the page the layout needs to remain the same. It's not just references. Uh, just to give you a sense of how culturally important uh, the layout is, if you Google, put in quotes, four lines from the bottom, uh, you'll get 156,000 results. The top six are web pages referring to the Talmud. Uh, this is because a lecturer uh, lecturing to students uh, or a study partner will communicate where to start reading based on the number of lines from some landmark on the page. This is especially critical because the Talmud lacks pat punctuation or paragraphs. Um, and, uh, and so that's one example of where it's important. Another example, um, there's this cultural phenomenon uh, called the Shas Polak. Shas, for various reasons, is another uh, term for the Talmud. Uh, a Shas Polak was a Jew, often from Poland, uh, who presumably had an eidetic memory. Uh, and he would perform the following trick called the pin test. Uh, somebody would take a volume of the Talmud at random and open it to the first page and put a pin through the page uh, through a random letter. Uh, and then for any subsequent page in the Talmud, uh, this Shas Polak would be able to tell you the letter and the word through which the pin uh, went. So this is a way of envisioning the images of the text almost as a 3D cube of text. Uh, here's another Oh, idea of, uh, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, a famous example where a Talmudic printing deviated. So from Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz. Um, so he uh, made this uh, commentary, which is now available by the way in digital uh, form. And uh, there was a big controversy because he introduced his commentary and he put it right over here where I'm moving my mouse. Um, and he moved Tosafot's commentary lower um, and so he was heavily criticized for it. And he basically answered an interview uh, a few years ago, look, it couldn't really be done because of all the difficulty of pagination. So are we gonna duplicate the page and then put my commentary on the side or are we gonna um, cut it into, sample, uh, into a different uh, layout? And he, what he did was cut it and there was a lot of blowback from it. Uh, now, in terms of modern websites, there, there are a bunch of modern web websites that uh, have interesting uh, features. So, for example, this is a place called Hachi Garcinon, where they uh, compare variants of the text um, uh, side by side, but in order, uh, they still have a feature where they superimpose that on the original text. Uh, and here is uh, the Safaria, which is an open source free digital Judaic library. They don't. Uh, have any focus on the traditional layout, which has led to difficulty in adopting it. Uh, here's a place called Dafachim, which is a video lecture, but they keep the image of the page and there's this pen that moves down the page uh, in, uh, in tandem with the, uh, with the audio. Um, and this is the Merkava that tries to preserve the same page layout, but puts some multimodal information like uh, this is uh, saying, uh, what is a question, what's an answer, and it would almost pass the pin test. And we want to do the same thing, but 
Uh, it's not. The current version is, does, doesn't have the original layout. So uh, Talmud.dev was, some, uh, was a, a place to try to do this kind of layout, and they figured out uh, an algorithm to sort of draw the bounding boxes and put all the text in, but for various reasons, it won't pass the pin test because that is not line by line. It's just that they know in SVG what the bounding boxes should be, and then they just have the text flow. So our approach uh, was uh, essentially to use an alignment algorithm is often used, uh, okay, uh, is often used for DNA sequencing. And here we're using it to align um, our text. And uh, we take the original Vilna text and, and we have all of the, the layout and we use Needleman Vunch to, with Safaria's uh, open source text. And the end result is, uh, and, then, and then we do various things to draw the image. And let me just uh, take one moment to uh, show you what the current results look like. 